Jordan Cronenworth, whom Ridley Scott hired to be the director of photography on Blade Runner, was one of the greatest cinematographers of our modern age. I think Jordan, Jordan was one that represented probably one of the best of the best. And Jordan is one of the most important cameramen in Hollywood at that point. Well, we all paint with light, but he was uh, one of the grandmasters, as far as I'm concerned. He was born here in California in uh, 1935. And when Jordan came to working age, uh, worked as an assistant at the lab, you know, in Columbia. I think uh, Columbia was doing a Western and was short of camera assistants. And so he left the lab, his summer job, and went and worked as a camera assistant and then never went back to school. When I met him at the American Film Institute, we clicked as friends immediately because we were both very passionate about photography. He'd even come out of that Connie Hall, Haxel Wexler school where I think Jordan had put him in an operator. Jordan and he struck up a, a relationship and a friendship and then went on to you know, collaborate on the next 10 movies that Conrad did. And then I believe that it was a, a picture that Conrad was offered that uh, he turned down and recommended Jordan and Jordan went on to shoot that and uh, started his career as a cinematographer. I'll tell you, one of the most amazing things that I remember about Jordan was on Cutter's Way, I was the AFI intern and trying to be, you know, a fly on the wall. And he said, put a double in that light. And so I can put a double in. And then he said, now put a single in. And he said, put a single in the light. And he turned to me and he said, Ernie, what do you think? A double or a single? <laughs> You could have knocked me over with a leaf. I was just floored that this man would ask me what I thought about lighting his set. So I said, well, I think you ought to put a double in it. <laughs> he said, absolutely right. Put a double in it. Ridley had said that he wanted the overall look of this film to be dark, and he meant that literally. In other words, we're going to bring down the house lights as much as we can. Jordan would put a lot, quite a lot of light on and then crush it now. And uh, he absolutely understood the layers and layers of light on big setups. But, and he was nearly wide open all the time, so the corners don't go black. But actually you have layers and layers and layers of light which you can actually crush. And still one of the best negatives. He was a fan of Kodak's fast film. Not, not necessarily wanting to push it, but the faster the film got, the, you know, the more fun he had with, uh, it always seemed like, how can we shoot this with no light? <laughs> he said, why don't we just deduct light? You know, so, you know, and I thought, well, that sounds like a great idea, because I'm a grip, and, and now I'm gonna be able to do a lot of lighting, and you know, basically just, putting big blacks up on over the side and just taking them out the light. His favorite quote of mine was, it's not what you light, it's what you don't light that separates you from everyone else. So it's like the lack of overlighting negative sources, negative feels, and good, good contrast. I could vision him sitting there and staring through the camera because Jordan would just hang in there and he would look through the camera until it just seemed right. He was never in a hurry. Let's look at what we have and how do we make it better? And he was brilliant at that. But he was one of the most tenacious and stubborn men I've ever known. And, and I mean that in, in, a, in a positive way because he would fight to keep his imagery as sharp and as vital as he could up until the last minute when, you know, he gave the set over to the director. You know, hey, look, two creative people with one eyepiece, come on, guys, <laughs> something's gonna happen. He's not the quickest person in the world, but usually the best aren't. And you know, when I'm throwing up a shot of a room which is the size of this building, you know, it's gonna take time to light it, otherwise I'm going to hate it. So I've actually got to be patient, and I understand that. 
the old saying goes that it's not the time it takes to takes the takes that takes the time. It's the time between the takes that takes the time. <laughs> Jordan had a almost like a Vermeerish type of approach to light. Everything was sourced interestingly. There were deep pools of darkness, and there was always a very, very complicated palette. And it certainly wasn't just like a flat, high key, you know, overall wash of light as so many other films are. Uh, he really knew what he was doing. You know what? I'll tell you the secret: is a large source as close to your subject as possible. You know, right on the sideline, right out of frame. And then you have all that wrap around. See, so you have a fill and a key all from one source. People will say, well, so-and-so is a really good cameraman, but he really can't light women. Jordan is a really good cameraman, but he could light women, he could light anything. I remember we were shooting at the Tyrell's office, the scene that preceded the Void Kampf scene, when uh, Rachel makes her entrance. And here's this incredible scene of, of art direction and light, and this beautiful, beautiful woman with the most elegant skin. And she walks into, in, in this beautiful light, and then a moment before she stops, there's this shadow that she walks through, just a tiny little shadow bar, which I thought, he added that as we were lighting the shot. And uh, he looked at me and just gave me a little wink when he did that. And I knew exactly what he meant. You know, it was like, yeah, this is it. This is like the cream in the coffee, as he used to say. I think that he preferred the light to be invisible and to be natural and to come from natural places and not be contrived. Blade Runner, of course, is an exception to that because it was a world that was not real to start with. And so it introduced, of course, uh, much more dramatic and progressive lighting sources than we were all used to before. One of the things that he did learn on Blade Runner was you don't have to have an excuse for a light coming from somewhere. It's, the light is there. And when you really look at it in real life, light's coming from everywhere. And um, in fact, the first time we were in Deckard's apartment, during a rehearsal, actually Ridley had his eye on the camera, and Jordan had told me, you know, every like 20, 30 seconds, have one of the guys swing a xenon through the window. And then Dick Hart's guys took him and lit him and, you know, and put him in position and just swished him through the, uh, through the set. And God, Ridley's seen that and he goes, fuck me. <laughs> And, uh, and Jordan said, well, you know, it's a shaft of light coming through. And Jordan said, have him do it again while we were all standing up. And he went through again and hit all pictures on the piano, hit everything. Well, Ridley said, I like that. I like, let's, let's use it. And then that was the beginning of the Zeons. From that time on, the Zeons were everywhere. A lot of people that know Blade Runner do not believe that we had just four one kilowatt xenon searchlights. If you look at a lot of his movies, obviously the camera moves quite a bit, but it's always motivated. Our medium storytelling, so we're advancing the story, and I think that he never wanted to interfere with that. He only wanted to enhance the experience, add content through light and through composition and through camera movement if and when it needed to be moved. He was such a meticulous artist and, uh, and, and would constantly run the setups through his head and talk about them with me. And Jordan would go, oh my God, I screwed that up or this up. My father was like every artist. He was never happy with anything until years and years later and then would kind of go back and, and watch something and then appreciate his own accomplishment finally after he got through the, the pain and suffering of what didn't work. He was such a taskmaster on himself, but you know, I would just look at him and I'd say, you're so full of shit, this stuff is just landmark. No one has ever made a film that looks like this.
Looking back on it, Jordan was very proud of what we had done. Later, uh, the film got ignored at Oscar time, which was really sad. The divine injustice of its lack of recognition by the Academy and by the ASC at that time was just frightening. He was a brilliant, brilliant cameraman. And I think he got screwed not being nominated for an Academy Award. There's no two ways about it. But in Jordan's case, uh, he won the BAFTA, which is the English Academy Award for cinematography on Blade Runner, which was well-deserved. Interesting, BAFTA, it's the opposite way that our Academy works, you know. That's why often you hear when people get nominated here, it's all about the nomination and not so much the award. Of course, everybody wants the award, but um, there it's, it's your peers that actually decide that. So it, it meant a lot. It was nice validation for, you know, an accomplishment. Do you know when, when he won the BAFTA? Uh, it was the middle of the night and he called me from England. He called me from England and said, we've won the BAFTA. We've won the BAFTA, and he included me as uh, as a partner in that, and I was stunned at his generosity. I learned I learned a lot from that man. He was comfortable enough as an artist and as a professional that he looked at sharing his knowledge as a gift that he could give to other people. You know what? I tell you something. All your good photographers are sharers. They don't have any secrets because they know there's no secrets. He shared everything with everybody who was interested. If somebody was interested in lighting or cinematography, he was there for them. I came in uh, toward the end, there were about four weeks left to go, to do one shot one night. It was the car going through the tunnel, the Third Street Tunnel, downtown with the white tile walls and everything. And Ridley liked what I did and kept me for the rest of the show. And uh, Jordan, one of the most wonderful human beings I've ever known, was very generous and uh, he just said, uh, Ridley likes your stuff, go out and do it. He just sort of gave me a free hand to do. I knew what filtration, I knew what you know, what they were doing with smoke and had a sense of some of the lighting setups. So I was able to replicate Jordan's work very easily. He didn't feel like he had any mysterious secrets or exposure secrets or tricks that, uh, that for a long time people kept to themselves. And so there's a whole array of us that grew up under his tutelage that are all shooting, working cinematographers now all in the AAC. Everybody, it seems, that uh, was fortunate enough to, to work with him certainly gained a lot uh, by that experience. One of the things I learned from Jordan is, you know, if you think of something at take three or four that you want to change or you get an idea, I mean, creativity is a linear process. And let's face it, a creative mind doesn't stop creating just because you start shooting take one or take five. And if, you know, Jordan thought of something that he wanted to do after the first couple of camera takes. What well, he did it, and he threw it in. It's really funny. One of the second ADs on Blade Runner called me two or three years after the movie and said, Ernie, we're working on a music video and the director loves Blade Runner, and he wants this music video to look like Blade Runner, so he wants to know what kind of film it was shot on. <laughs> so I said, well, 5247, you know. But, you know, shooting with the same film stock is not going to reproduce that look. But certain directors like Phil Juano, you know, and David Fincher, they knew what was going on, and they wanted to work with Jordan, of course, and did on a number of projects. His work was beautiful. It was different on uh, many occasions. It was all different from each one to the next. And I've never seen a movie that he made that wasn't an extraordinarily looking movie. 
he wasn't predictable. You couldn't say, oh, this is what he does. What he does was constantly reinvent himself and do different things. And I think that is one of the most amazing things about his artistry is that you, you couldn't define him by one movie or by one uh, scene or by one uh, conversation. For a number of years, my father had suffered from a disease that was unknown at the time, and it put, uh, it put him in a physical, mentally perfectly clear. Physically, it, it drained him. Jordan had really got it down. I mean, he, you know, and then his body gave out. But he finally, you know, he, he figured it out, and his body lost it, yeah. He was misdiagnosed, and the medication he was taking was the exact opposite of what he should have been taking for what was really wrong with him. In the end, when we finally discovered what it was, and, and, it, and embarrassingly, it wasn't a doctor that discovered it. They were at a cocktail party, you know, six months after Blade Runner, and someone inadvertently said, how long has your husband had Parkinson's disease? And, and she was like, no, of course, he's got MS. Says, oh no, he's got Parkinson's. I think they went to a neurologist that week and he got back about 80% of his mobility and went on to do five or six more features. He dealt with it so evenly and so he would joke about it. And like I said, he was just, he's just a kind and gentle man and he didn't, he didn't let his physical problems interfere with his art. You can never feel sorry for yourself or let your fatigue or your duress come into play when you saw someone that had so many obstacles to overcome that never ever lost focus, compromised shots, let integrity drop. It was always about the shot till the end when they called rap. But I don't know how he did it. I have no idea how he survived. He's a, it's a testament to willpower and durability and the inner strength of a human being. In the end, my father eventually succumbed to Parkinson's disease and he was in uh, intensive care for months and then never <clears throat> fully recovered from that. I was kind of embarrassed with myself because I, I didn't want to be there. You know, I knew I should be there. It's one of those things where I, I knew I should be there and I should show my respect, but he, w he was in such sad shape that I don't know if, if he would, would have wanted me there. You know, and I tell you, I, I, I... He just didn't wake up after Thanksgiving one day. And so I think that it, at some point the, the burden was too much and the, the strength it took to fight it was too much and uh, he didn't. As a cinematographer, Jordan's passing was a huge loss to our community. He was the best of us. I think today he empowers young cinematographers and old cinematographers that, that want to reflect back on, on another uh, master of the craft, whether it was a commercial or a music video or a concert movie or, or a film. And I think that he leaves a, a lasting lesson to just be observant to what goes on naturally around us and, and love light and watch it and be it, you know, feel it and it'll come across.